One of the things that people fail to realize <clears throat> is that the National Historic Old Spanish Trail has some anomalies that most people miss. First of all, it is not old. Second of all, it is not Spanish. Third of all, it's not a trail. And fourth of all, you can use your imagination. This is the old Spanish trail. This is where they camped, watered their stock. They had come all the way from the crossing of the Fathers. They went down through Lone Rock near Page, Arizona, up to Waweep Creek. Dominguez Escalante in 1776 and 1829 for Armijo. They both have interactions with this particular canyon. This is the Hurricane Cliffs. It's 180 miles long. There was desecration, there's demolition, there's removal. In the process of that, the first thing that I did was say, how come you're doing this? This particular location is one of the more scenic locations along the Old Spanish Trail. One of the problems they had was finding a location to come up the, uh, and to top the mesa. One of the things that we've found is that it's a challenge in the Old Spanish Trail Association is trying to get the recognition of people who either don't understand or don't even know the trail exists. And so building the silhouettes and working on all of those things that might help us has been a part of that ambition. And so Ashley Hall, he was the president at one time for the old Spanish trail, joined me for a flight in an airplane that's a little bit different. It was called a Cetabria. And the Cetabria is of interest because it's an airplane that you can go low and slow and high and fast, whatever your choice is. And the average altitude that we we're flying was 25 to 50 feet over the, off the ground, AGL. When we looked down at the Iron Springs area, lo and behold, two trail aficionados, we noticed that the solar panels were pl being placed exactly on the trail. There was desecration, there's demolition, there's removal. It was one of those things that neither, neither of us ever thought about. In the process of that, the first thing that I did was to go to the Iron County Commission, to the planning area, and say, how come you're doing this? One of the things that I learned was that nobody knew where the trail was. The planning organization didn't know, the state didn't know, the maps didn't show it. And he says, what are we supposed to do? So Ashley and I came up with the idea that we were going to mark the trail and mark it in such a way that it would be both interpreted and at the same time would also be informational to the planners and therefore would appear on the GIS mapping and other forms of interest. And so at that time we pursued the idea and I acquired some steel and a plasma cutter and started to work on a design and what you see here is the results of that design. So as it stands right now, we have 18 sites, 147 silhouettes. We have 28 of them on order right now for the state. They're going to be distributed as soon as people come and pick them up. And the rest of it, as they say, is history.
Some years ago, I got involved in a need to mark the trail and try and identify it, not only so people could find it, but so that our planners would be aware of where the trail was. And so I wound up designing and autographing these, uh, the plans for the silhouettes, tracing them. And then I worked with Southern Utah University to have them digitized into a plan form that could be used for computer graphics. And that's how I made the patterns and everything since. The benefit and the importance of this location is that this hill to my right is the first and only place in the entire 12 mile line of the most arduous trail in history. The National Historic Old Spanish Trail at that point is the first point you actually see the Moabi Desert and see that you have limitless desert ahead of you to transcrop. The other side of it is if you're returning with herds of horses, five to seven thousand as many, and as you come through this area, those who are survivors and the animals who are survivors, once they got to this point and could see this cleft to the mountain, that was the first indication that they would survive. Because from this point on, there's water, there's forage, the Santa Clara River, mountain meadows, the Great Basin, Newcastle, Iron Springs, everything in relationship was now an easy path. This is the Old Spanish Trail. We are essentially center line on the Old Spanish Trail. Highway 91 is slightly to my right. Utah Hill, as it's called, we're right at the crest of the Utah Hill. It's a little over 1,500 feet from here until you get down to the Virgin River. This has been a combined effort. It's been a cooperative effort. It's been a successful effort. And I hope all of the people that have an opportunity will learn something when they come to this location. We're right now sitting in uh, Rock Canyon, referred to as Rock Canyon, refers to the limestone in this canyon is where they camped, watered their stock on their route in 1829 on December 17th. They had come all the way from the crossing of the Fathers. They went down through Lone Rock near Page, Arizona, up to Waweep Creek. Out of there, eventually got over to what we call the Coxcomb. And we say they went uh, north up into the Priya Box area, which is how they got through the Coxcomb, and then up onto Cedar, Cedar Mountain, Buckskin Mountain area, eventually to what we call the Red Pueblo site, which I believe is uh, just south of Highway 89, off a ridge. There's known Anasazi or ancestral Puebloan ruins there, and it's a, it's a valley or a, they call the White Sage Valley. Uh, a likely route, because it's the easiest way to go when you get to the summit of the land between Page and Kanab. It's a route that funnels itself down south of Fredonia, then funnels just then right back up towards the uh, site of the Old Woman Wash, which is Pipe Spring, Arizona. Um, and then on to this area here, down into the Fort, uh, Fort Pierce area, stinking water, St. George area and Santa Clara, and then on to Las Vegas. Um, what we're dealing with now on the route, our Miho route, 19, 1829, which is the only time that he came this way. When he came back, a short while later with his mules and horses, some of them went the same route, some of them went a little different route through this area. But after that, they took another route north up through Moab, Green River, Salina, down 
basically the I-15 corridor into the St. George area. Where we're sitting right now is, as I mentioned, is the Limestone Canyon. And just down off of here, I'm sure they tried to get down here when they arrived to get the water pockets in here and uh, found themselves at a big cliff about three quarters of a mile down. Couldn't go. So they backtracked and they went up, up along the Honeymoon Trail route and got down to Fort Pierce area that way. Think about that expedition. I mean, that's, these are men that had nothing, no modern way of navigating. They've navigated by the stars. They navigated by Navajo, Paiute, Ute people giving them directions, sometimes not always the best directions, but they got here. And they got here in pretty good time considering what they were bringing with them. I'm uh, standing here on location at what today is known as Rock Canyon, but in 1829, Antonio Armijo, when his mule caravan came through this area, they made a diary note that they had stopped at a limestone canyon that had pools of water. So um, we're on location at one of the few sites on the Armijo route where, based on the diary, you can say you're traveling in those footsteps. And I want to acknowledge that this, this land is historically part of the Kaibab band of the, of the Southern Paiutes. So there's a reservation today that was formed uh, back in the early 1900s for the, for the Kaibab tribe. Uh, but this is their homeland in this area. It takes a bit of investigative work. You have to look at a diary backward several days and forward and put any single diary reference in, a, in context. And so you do that by building up a series of probably eight campsites in the distance the parties would have traveled, any points of geography that would help guide the path and sources of water. So to get to this site, you back up all the way to a creek that was named after a ram. So we think that's Kanab Creek. And the next site was a spring of the old woman. So that's a possibility of being pipe spring and perhaps maybe there was an elderly uh, Paiute woman there at that watering hole. That was uh, something that happened and noted in other um, pioneer diaries of uh, that culture. And then they talk about a coyote plain. So their next campsite was waterless across this coyote plain. And when you travel from Pipe Spring straight west, that's exactly what you see. It's this amazingly flat plain that really stands out because they've been traveling up and down through all these canyons for over, you know, hundreds of miles literally, and all of a sudden they hit this perfectly flat plain. So the, the distances are matching from Kanab Creek, Pipe Spring, Coyote Plain, so you, you kind of know how much, how far they're traveling each day. And then the next uh, spot is the Limestone Canyon with pools of water. The history of this site is rich, just from a Spanish trail perspective. Dominguez Escalante in 1776 and 1829 for Armijo, they both have um, uh, interactions with this particular canyon. The next part of the Armijo diary, the reconnaissance team came back, they said they didn't find another way down. So that's pretty strong evidence then that they went down real close to here because the next entry is they're at the Stinking Water Canyon that we believe is on the, between here and St. George where there's a permanent pool of water. We're on the Honeymoon Trail and the Old Armijo route of the Old Spanish Trail. 
uh, which was established or at least found in 1829. It was only used to go to California in 1829 and then return in the 1830. This is the 37th parallel. You can see the fence. If I was on the other side, I'd be in Arizona. This side, I'm in Utah. Uh, so this is the kind of country they were going across. It's amazing to me that Congress could pick such a lousy number, 37th parallel, in 1850. It wasn't until John Wesley Powell was done in 1869 they found out how rough it was. This is a thousand feet to the bottom. Well, maybe 980, but it's a long ways down and you're you're going with Ar uh, Armijo's group. They had a reconnaissance for three days. They found enough water to work this over, but they needed a way to get off the cliffs. Now, this is the Hurricane Cliffs. It's 180 miles long. And most of it, even today, there's only a very few places you can actually cross. This is Warner Valley. This is where they went down. And Fort Pierce Wash, they followed down and hit the Virgin River. And then as, after they hit the Virgin River, they only had to walk another quarter of a mile, maybe a half, until they got to the Santa Clara River. I'm standing here on location with a sweeping view of the Virgin River here. Um, this is a very special place on the Old Spanish Trail. It's not on the National Register at this moment, but it's something that certainly has the qualifications to be on the National Register. I want to say Merry Christmas to you all because Antonio Armijo who first opened up commerce between Santa Fe and Los Angeles. This was his Christmas Day campsite right down here on the Virgin River. That uh, mule caravan left Santa Fe on November 8th and they were on the Arizona Strip at the Limestone Canyon to the water holes in that area on December 17th. And eight days later, they had come down off the Hurricane Cliffs and they spent Christmas Day here on the banks of the Virgin River. So Merry Christmas to you all. Jedediah Smith from the St. George area followed the Virgin River all the way through the gorge. And that is one tough canyon. They barely made it through, but he put the word out, do not go through the gorge. So Armijo actually bypassed um, that Virgin Gorge and likely came through the mountains there to the north and then finally joining up to the, to the Virgin River here. John C. Fremont in May of 1844. He was the U.S. government surveyor that had been to Oregon and California and on his return trip got on the Spanish Trail in the Mojave Desert and actually used that term that made it onto the maps uh, being on the Spanish Trail. He visited this site on May 8, 1844, and he had trouble following the trail because the trail had to meander and do several river crossings. There was about 10 different river crossings back and forth uh, between here and the Mesquite, Nevada area. So in some sections, the trail was hard to follow. I want to acknowledge the Arizona State BLM office. They have made this video project uh, possible through a grant and this video project actually satisfies three of the five performance goals um, that the grant uh, addressed. So one of those goals is to increase public knowledge of the Old Spanish National Historic Trail through signage and part of this video project was to um, highlight some new interpretive signs and mule caravan silhouettes that have recently been installed at Castle Cliff. Another performance goal is to increase public knowledge of the Old Spanish Trail through media and public relations. So this video project is right on mark with that objective and we're very happy that we can be here in such a beautiful setting to fulfill that.
performance um, um, goal. The third item is for this grant to make recommendations for recreational use and opportunities for interpretation. And so in our final report, we'll be making those recommendations to a number of federal land managers that are situated along the Armijo route between Page, Arizona, far to the east, and here in Littlefield, Arizona. This is the other, the western anchor to this grant project. If you're listening to this video, um, be involved. The trail goes through some amazing landscapes and national parks and monuments, backcountry roads, uh, whatever your mode of transportation and whatever turns you on, uh, there's a piece of the old Spanish trail that will resonate with you. So I hope you can be part of that. Because a lot of people now don't have the exposure and the experience and the knowledge about the old Spanish trail. So state by state now, you're starting to see uh, signs go up, uh, interpretive signs and displays where you can learn more about the story of that area for the old Spanish trail. So uh, this is a chance to get in at an exciting phase of our organization where momentum is building and good things are happening.